All right. Well, since we're talking about about geeky mathematical things, I'm going to mention one more geeky mathematical thing because it's one of my favorite topics related to field theory, actually. Um, and this is something I think everybody should see at least sometime. Um, So this is the quadratic equation, right? AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. And you can say, um, forgetting about integers, right? Just in plain old real numbers or complex numbers, is there an X which makes this equation true, right? And we all know this, X equals negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four AC all divided by two A. At least when I went to school, everybody knew it that word for word, right? It was like just one big word with 80 syllables in it because um, we had to memorize it. That's the quadratic formula. It tells us the x is which will make this equation true. And a linear equation, ax plus b equals zero, well that has a really simple solution, x equals negative b over a. So both of these, if you know what a and b are, or a, b, and c, you can just plug them into this formula, turn the crank, and you get some x's popping out. Okay, cubic equation, Is there a formula we can plug A, B, C, and D in and turn the crank and we get X's out that satisfy this? Yes. yes. It's called the uninspired name of the cubic equation. Kind of like the quadratic equation. And that's been known for some time. And the quartic equation, is there a formula for that? There actually is. It's pretty ugly, but you can put in A, B, C, and D and turn the crank and you get out the roots of this equation. Um, so before computers and before YouTube, um, one favorite pastime that people did was they solved equations, <laughs> right? Um, and it was a form of sport. Right? And towns would have like a town champion who was like the best person at solving equations and they would challenge other towns. And you know, one would travel to the other and they'd bring their champion with them and they'd sit down at tables and they'd hand each other a sheet of 30 equations and they'd see who could solve the equations first or more likely who could solve the most equations in say a month or some period of time. And people would wager on this, right? Bet big money. Um, I don't know if they had fantasy leagues, that would be pretty twisted. Um, but this was, this was entertainment, this was sport, right? And equation solving was, was a very mysterious thing. So people knew about the quadratic equation because that went back to the Greeks. And um, cubic equations were not so easy to solve, but there were some forms of them that were easy to solve. For example, um, if B was zero, I think that was a form that was particularly easy to tackle. Or if there was some peculiar relationship between B, C, and D, maybe that was a form that you had. But, people would discover new ways to solve more of these equations. And when they found that, they would not publish it. They wouldn't tell anybody. They would tuck it in their pocket and they'd use it in these contests. And somebody would hand them a question and maybe half the questions had this form that this person knew how to solve. So they'd wait till the end of the time and they'd hand it back and they'd answer more questions and they'd win the prize money. Um, so equation solving has been a subject of interest for thousands of years. Um, and eventually a way was discovered to solve quartic equations, but nobody found a way to do the quintic, the fifth degree equations. Plug in A, B, C, D, E, and F into a formula, turn the crank, and out comes the roots of this. Nobody was able to find one. And it was finally proven that there is no such formula. I think about that for a minute. It's one thing to say, I don't know a formula for this, but to say, no matter how clever you are, no matter how hard you work, you will never discover a formula. How do you prove something like that? It's one thing to prove a formula works. You can plug it in and do some things and say, yeah, this is a root. But proving you can't find something, that's really, really a different business, right? But nonetheless, this was proven that it's impossible to come up with a formula that solves a general fifth degree polynomial. 
and it was proven by someone named Galois. And Google him later if you want to read a really fascinating history. Galois was, um, he was 18 or 20 years old. And he liked mathematics as a recreation. Um, he was cursed with bad luck in so many different forms. Um, he applied for study in mathematics at a school and his application was lost. And he reapplied and the person who received his application passed away and there was no record of it. And he was eating dinner one night in an area, a public area with some friends and people were talking about revolution and um, he made some comment and gesticulated while he was still holding his knife and the people in the dining hall thought that it was a call to arms and a riot broke out and when the police broke it up and they asked who started this they said he did and he got thrown in jail for a while so he was just cursed with bad luck um, and he had a, a um, the misfortune of getting involved with a woman who was also involved with someone who was an expert marksman good with a gun and this person challenged him to a duel and he felt like he had no choice but to, you know, meet this person the next morning at sunrise in this battle to the death. Um, and so like any good math geek, he pulled an all-nighter the night before. He spent the whole night writing down all of his theories, including his proof that this cannot be solved. He had proven that, and he'd send it in to some people, and they didn't understand what he was doing. They're like, you're not a mathematician. This is garbage, right? So he wrote down all of his theories. Today we call it Galois theory. Um, and he didn't get any sleep, and he didn't really know anything about shooting guns anyway, and so he went to this duel and he got shot in the stomach and he died a few days later of an infection. Um, and it was quite a number of years later, like decades, that people started looking at the stuff that he had written down the night before he died and started realizing this was genius. And they finally, mathematics had advanced enough that the mathematicians of those years could understand what he was doing and they pieced together this whole theory he had developed that, among other things, proved that you cannot solve this equation. And the error is called Galois theory. It's one of the most beautiful areas of mathematics to me. Um, and it's sort of a starting point for something more generally called um, group theory or field theory. And there's, there's tons of applications of this stuff now. And it was this total unknown with no formal training in mathematics who just, like, came up with this stuff. So he's, like, an interesting character. Another thing you can prove with Galois theory, how many people have done constructions with straight edge and compass? Right, so you get a, just a ruler without any marks on it and you get a compass that you can use to draw circles and you say, what can I do with this? Well, you can certainly draw a straight line, right? Just draw a mark along the edge of the ruler. And if you put a mark here and a mark here, can you divide that region exactly in half? And it turns out you can. You take your compass and you draw a circle around this point and you draw the same diameter circle around this point and where they intersect draw a straight line that's exactly the halfway point so there's all kinds of constructions you can do you can cut an angle in half you can cut an angle into four pieces you can actually make a perfect 17-sided polygon Gauss learned how to do this or figured out how to do this 17-sided polygon just with a straight edge and compass well one thing you cannot do in general is take an arbitrary angle and cut it into three even angles, trisecting an angle. I spent a good chunk of my ninth grade year trying to do that because my teacher said nobody knew if you could do it or not. But it turns out you can't do it, and Galois theory also proves that. And it's almost the same proof as the proof that you can't solve the quintic equation. Just a very different way of looking at the world. All right, that's not on the exam. That's just geeking out. And that's because now we got to do some stuff that's a little dry, but we got to do it anyway. Um, so modular exponentiation. So we're going to talk about crypto stuff on Friday, and if we get to it, we'll do public key cryptography, and this relies heavily on modular exponentiation. 
So what's the idea here? We want to do complex calculations with integers. And instead of doing things like multiplying really big numbers together, we're going to find ways to work with smaller numbers and sort of make the problem doable, doable sometimes with just pencil and paper. So here's the idea of, of um, modular exponentiation. So our goal We want to compute some number b raised to some power modulo something. So for example, find uh, 3 to the 17th modulo 7. So multiply 3 by itself 17 times and see what the remainder is when you divide by 7. Now if we have a computer, this is pretty easy. So BC is a binary calculator program. It's part of standard Unix distribution. BC-L lets us work with floating point numbers so we can do regular arithmetic. Um, so um, 3 to the 17th 3 up arrow 17 is that number. It's not ridiculous, but, you know, it's bigger than we want to work with by hand. So take that and divide it by 7, and we get this thing with a little bit left over. So if I do this thing minus 7 times, what you get when you divide it, which is this, it tells me I've got 5 left over. So 3 to the 17th should be congruent to 5 modulo 7. But that's if you've got a computer or a nice calculator handy. Suppose you don't. Well, remember, there's two things we can do. We can compute 3 to the 17th and then see what that is, modulo 7. That's what we just did with the computer. Or we can reduce modulo 7 any time we want, and we should get the same answer. So I'm going to make a table. 3 to the 1 is just 3. 3 squared is 9, but that's also 2. It's 2 more than a multiple of 7. 3 cubed is 3 times 3 squared. And since 3 squared is congruent to 2, this is congruent to 3 times 2, which is just 6. 3 to the 4th is congruent to 3 times 3 cubed, which is 3 times 6, which is 18, which is modulo 5, that's just 3. Sorry, for modulo 7. Um, so 4 more than 14, so that's 4. So 3 to the 5th is congruent to 5. We can keep doing this. It's going to take a while, but we'll get there in 17 steps. But it's not a lot of fun, especially if instead of doing 3 to the 17th, we were doing 3 to the 17 millionth. We don't want to do this 17 million times. There's a better way we can do this. So this is not modular exponentiation. This is just plain old modular arithmetic. Let me show you modular exponentiation approach. So we're going to start the same, 3 to the first is just 3. 3 squared is 9, which is actually just 2. I'm going to skip 3 to the third. I'm going to square this number, and I'm going to get 3 to the fourth. This is 3 squared squared. And since 3 squared is 2, this is 2 squared, which is 4. And I jump down to here without having to do as much work. Okay, what about 3 to the 8th? That's just 3, four, three to the 4th quantity squared. All right, so exponents multiply when you put them outside parentheses like this. And 3 to the 4th is congruent to 4, so this is congruent to 4 squared, which is 16. And now I'll actually do some work. What is 16 mod 7? That's just 2. 
and 3 to the 16th is going to be 3 to the 8th squared, which is 2 squared, which is 4. And if I wanted to keep going, I've got a pattern now. 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4. I don't even have to think about it at this point. If I wanted to find 3 to the 32nd, 3 to the 64th, it's just going to alternate 2s and 4s. So I'm writing down powers of 3 where the power is a power of 2. Why am I doing that? Because if I write the number 17 in binary, that tells me how to write 17 as a sum of powers of 2. This is equal to 2 to the 4th plus 2 to the 1st. And so 3 to the 17th is 3 to the 2 to the 4th plus 2 to the 1st, or if I like, 3 to the 16 plus 1. And exponents again tell me this is equal to the 3 to the 16th times 3 to the 1st. Now I go over here to my table and I say, what's 3 to the 16th? That's congruent to 4. What's 3 to the 1st? That's congruent to 3. So 3 to the 17th must be congruent to 12, which is 5 more than a multiple of 7. And that's all it takes. And if I had an exponent of a million, I would need 20 of these numbers here. But, you know, like I say, in this case, it's just alternating 2, 4, 2, 4. I spend more time writing it yeah, down than I'd spend actually thinking about it. And then whatever power you're raising it to, find the powers of 2 that add up to that. Multiply 3 to each of those, and there's your answer. Uh, I don't understand. Which one? Well, 2 to the 4th is 16. 2 to the 1st is 2. Oh, 2 to the 0. Yeah, and the rest of it's correct. So that's 3 to the 16 plus 1. Thank you. Yeah, whoever thought that up was was having a good day. So we can do this in general for, for computing these large exponentials. So like I say, Friday we're going to play with some of these things on the board, give you practice at working with them. All right, one more trick I want to show you. And this will be most of what we need to do crypto. So this is called Fermat's Little Theorem. And this was actually proven by Fermat. Um, so here's the statement of Fermat's Little Theorem. If P is prime, and P does not divide A, then the following is true. A to the P, A to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod P. So think about a prime number. And if A is a multiple of P, this is ridiculous. The whole thing is going to be a multiple of P, so it'll be congruent to 0. But other than that one ridiculous case, if we take any number a and raise it to the p minus 1, it's 1 more than a multiple of p. So for example, I don't know, pick your favorite prime, 101. So 57 to the 100th is congruent to 1 modulo 101. guaranteed. And it could be any number here um, that's not a multiple of 101. 
So 3 to the 100th, 17 to the 100th, 5 to the 100th, 2 to the 100th. Each of those is going to be one more than a multiple of 101. I don't think I can do that on BC. Oh, that's a big number. But sure enough, that's divisible by 101. So that's a useful result sometimes. The reason these things are useful is because they talk about, they give us information about things raised to big powers, possibly big things raised to big powers. And if we can reduce something to just being one, that's a really nice number to work with. Because we can take this and we could raise this to the millionth and a one to the millionth is still just one. And that's gonna be a useful trick. So this is a computer science course, and mostly what you've been teaching us up this time is mathematics, and lately number theory, mm -hmm. and that's all leading up to the fact that it's going to allow us to deal with cryptography. Among other is, things, yeah. Among other things, which, yeah. is, which is important to computer science. Yeah. Is that all correct? That's all correct. So, so if, if you're, every, most everybody here is in 224 right now, so we're doing a, just finished a program where you play a stick picking game and start out with a pile of sticks. You try to take either one, two, or three sticks each turn and you try to be the person to take the last stick. And the way you do that is you take the number of sticks that are left, mod four, that's how many sticks you should take. All right, so this, it pops up in lots of different places. Um, will we be dealing with a big old time compressing or did you only do that in, in um, I think we'll get into it a little bit in this course, depending on, on how we do time-wise. I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about algorithms, including Big O. But we definitely do it in 2.22. Um, but we can talk about it another time also if you want. Cool. So yeah, this, this unit is number theory, which is, which is more mathematics. And the geek stuff is, is just mathematics. But. But math and computer science are, are so similar in a lot of ways. And uh, the proof stuff is definitely going to feed into everything we do in 2.22 when we're doing recursion and recursive functions and things like that. Because that's all going to be just another form of induction which comes out of all the proof stuff, propositional logic. All right, so Friday, I want to talk about, I want to, I want to do some exercises on the board with GCD, some of these exponentiation tricks and so on. And I want to start talking about applications, things like parity checking, um, hashing, um, which are also 222 topics, um, UPC codes, and, and then talk about cryptography. And we'll probably flow into Monday when we're talking crypto. I don't know if we'll get through all of that on Friday, but that's where we're heading. Um, all right, so I will see you next time.